Now on BBC One, see here. Good morning and welcome to Behind the News in the News Cafe. Here they're having a discussion on education. Hi. And here there's a discussion going on on the sensitive issue of child protection. Hello John. Hi. You're surrounded by newspapers. Anything interesting? Thank you. In last month's Behind the News programme, Mark Nelson mentioned an earthquake. Well, there's been another one in central Italy. I've read in the papers that buildings, churches, paintings and sculptures have been destroyed, which is heartbreaking, as you know I love art. One of the basilicas has some beautiful artwork, particularly on its ceiling, but it's all been destroyed, completely ruined. They've had to call in art experts to try to retrieve fragments from the rubble and piece them together. It must be like piecing together a jigsaw puzzle, but much more difficult as it's on such an enormous scale, with pieces everywhere, and trying to put them together. What a mess. Yes, that's right. A certain amount has been recovered, but some works of art have been destroyed beyond repair and are lost to us forever. But what gets me is that the newspapers have just focused on the art, which is fair enough, but what about the people? Some people have lost their homes and 13 people have been killed. There are people who have lost everything. It's tragic. That reminds me of the refugees arriving in Dover, costing Kent County Council millions, and all because of changes in European law. Yes, what happened? There was a programme shown in Eastern Europe, in the Czech Republic seen by a lot of gypsies and it said that the best place to live is Britain and a huge number of them decided to make their way here. It's all happened as a result of the European Union's Dublin Convention where it was decided to relax the asylum controls, allowing people to travel freely across Europe, enabling them to seek asylum wherever they please. But how will they cope? The languages are so different. Yes. Oh, I've also read this funny article about people who have suffered damage to the part of the brain that controls language. They can get what is known as foreign accent syndrome, which means they start to speak with a foreign accent. For example, one Scottish woman who had a strong Scottish accent woke up one morning speaking like Winnie Mandela, you know, Nelson Mandela's ex-wife. Wouldn't it be great if all hearing people could wake up signing? It'd be really useful if they were deaf and could sign. Yes. And there was another story about a man who assaulted his wife, damaging her hearing and causing tinnitus. She took him to court and he claimed his tinnitus had driven him to it. And now they both suffer from it. And she lost her hearing. How awful. And another article which caught my eye was about the resignation of the Arts Council's chairperson. The rumours were that there was too much focus on elitist arts, such as opera and ballet, and not enough on community-based projects. That could be good news for us, because hopefully his replacement will be someone who's more committed to community-based arts. And who knows, they may even fund a deaf theatre company. Yes, perhaps we could see a deaf theatre company established. Did you know that the government are proposing a number of changes to legislation? One in particular relates to education. Last week, Behind the News went to the press conference launching the Green Paper. It's all about special educational needs. Let's see what's been proposed.
the government launching their proposals on how they intend to change the way that children with special educational needs are educated. But who does this apply to exactly? Well, supposing within a group of children of the same age, there are those who have a significantly greater difficulty in learning than their peers. These children need more time to develop and would be considered as having special educational needs. Another definition would be children with disabilities, either sensory or physical. They would also be considered to have special educational needs. The stage that we're at now is that the government have launched their green paper, which is a consultative document, and anyone is entitled to make their views on the proposals known to the government. After all the comments are received, the government will make amendments to the green paper and then it will become what's called a white paper. The suggestions that are contained within the white paper will be put to parliament to become law. What is crucial is that all the government's proposals are properly discussed and they're all contained in this document here. The main issues that drew the most attention from the media at the press launch were the issues of integrated education in mainstream schools and the proposed new role for special schools. At the press launch, we took the opportunity to ask the Minister for Special Educational Needs, Estelle Morris, to explain to us exactly what the government's proposals mean. We see a continuing role for special schools but a changing role. At the moment, there are some children who we feel should have access to mainstream school, but they're being denied that access because, for example, the schools aren't adapted to be able to take them. What we'd like to see of special schools is that they move outside of the special school and that they have a role of supporting children within mainstream schools. They have a role of working with mainstream teachers so that they're better able to work with those children with SEN who are in those classes. Well, it seems that what the Minister is saying is that more children will be taken out of special schools and placed in mainstream provision. But do the teachers in mainstream schools really have the skills to deal with deaf children? Have they been properly trained? Well, that's something that deaf organisations have long been concerned about and been asking for. Back to the Minister. We do need more training for both teachers who teach in special schools and teachers who teach in mainstream schools. If we're going to be serious about inclusion, we've got to make sure that teachers in the classroom have got the qualifications and the experience needed to teach successfully. Now, for instance, I, I know from having spoken to you that there are a shortage of teachers who can use sign language to support children who are deaf in mainstream schools. And sometimes within local authorities, they don't address that problem because the number of such teachers needed is quite small. What we want to try and do is to tackle issues like that, the training of teachers with sign language, on a regional basis so that it is a more effective use of in-service teacher training and perhaps working with institutions and voluntary organisations on a regional basis to make sure that more training is available. Now I'd like to ask representatives from deaf organisations what they think. With me today is Paul Simpson, who's education advisor to parents with deaf children for the NDCS, and Sue Unger, who is education strategist for the BDA. First, I'd like to ask you just for your immediate response to what you've heard the minister say. Well, really, there was nothing new. Deaf children have been mainstream for some time. There was no specific information about deaf children, nothing in-depth about deaf education. Really, the Minister's comments are very global. Yeah. I think we feel quite reassured by the two points that the Minister has just made, but I do have to agree with Sue that uh, anybody would be hard-pushed to find anything deaf-specific within this document. Let me ask you both. You've both read the proposals. Is there anything in there that you're concerned about, anything you'd support, anything you really disagree with? What do you think? One of the problems with the document is that it says SEN means learning difficulty. The problem for the deaf child 
is that they get labelled as having learning difficulties. I disagree with that. The difficulty is given to the child when in fact it belongs to the teacher and their ability to communicate with the child. So their definition of SEN just isn't appropriate for the deaf child. I feel there's a need to think through how this can be changed. Secondly, the report says the government supports the Salamanca Declaration from Spain in 1994. It's interesting because the report details many issues involved in educating children with SEN. The government says it supports this, but makes no mention of Section 21. Section 21 states clearly, all deaf children should be entitled to British Sign Language and all deaf children should be allowed to go to a special school. Those two points are important. If the government means they are actually supporting that, then brilliant. If they're supporting inclusive education, but ignoring Section 21, that's the problem. It just isn't clear yet. I think it's actually quite exciting that the Green Paper is actually saying that um, education ought to be brought within the scope of uh, disability rights legislation that we have. Uh, my problem with that is that it might just mean a right to a mainstream education. That's fine, I think, for those who actually want it. It can be a positive choice for some parents of deaf children. But I think the right needs to be also, co also cover access to independent schools for deaf children so that children can ha end up having an appropriate education. Another thing, it says it includes funding for research. Research is important. We have to have some research because now deaf children have been mainstream education for some time. What are the improvements? What's the quality of it? We don't know. Without research, we can't assess how those changes have affected deaf children for the future. Well, discussion of these proposals is so important. All we've done here is just scratch the surface. They've really got to be looked at in greater depth, and that means that you have got to read the document and make your views known. You can do that by getting a copy of the Green Paper from your library, or if you've got access to the internet, you could call up the Department of Education and Employment's webpage. Unfortunately, as yet, there's no BSL translation on video that's available, but Sue tells me that the BDA is campaigning for just such a video so that we can all be involved in the discussion. If you have any views, you can make them known to the deaf organisations, or you can contact the Department of Education and Employment, but remember you have to do that before the 9th of January. That's the deadline. Now over to Carolyn, who's taking a look at the Queen's recent tour of Pakistan and India.
Last month's news was dominated by the Queen's visit to Pakistan and India. Both countries are celebrating 50 years of independence from British rule. Like other former British colonies, they are part of the Commonwealth and the Queen, as head of the Commonwealth, was invited to visit and join in the independence celebrations. There was a great deal of controversy surrounding the tour and it's still unclear exactly what happened. First, the Indian government criticised the Queen and the Foreign Secretary, Robin Cook, for seemingly meddling in Indian affairs. Then, at a banquet, the Queen urged India and Pakistan to end their differences over Kashmir. When India became independent, the country was split and Muslims went to live in Pakistan and the Hindus in India. Kashmir is Muslim, yet remains part of India and the two countries have twice been at war over the region. So, were the Queen and Robin Cook really meddling in Indian affairs, or were they merely trying to bring about peace in the region? Clark spoke to Jenny Bond, who's the BBC's court correspondent. Jenny was with the Queen on that visit. How does she feel about the tour? Well, the Queen, in everything she does, always acts on the advice of her ministers. They write all her speeches, so whatever she says is with their blessing. So really it's Robin Cook you have to look at here. The sensitivities of Kashmir cannot be underestimated, and maybe the government could have been more sensitive to the feelings over Kashmir. Pakistan, however, welcomed the Queen's comments as it put the issue into the international arena. This was an issue that had to be addressed by the Queen. She is, after all, head of the Commonwealth, and urging two Commonwealth countries to end their differences seems entirely appropriate. The Queen also wanted to visit the region of Amritsar, another sensitive area. The Indian government had advised the Queen not to go because of the massacre by the British that occurred there. But she did visit, laying a wreath and signing the Book of Remembrance. The Indians were angered and the newspapers said she should have done more and apologised for the massacre by the British. Prince Philip further inflamed Indian sensitivities by querying the number of people killed in the massacre. What does this incident tell us about how India today views Britain and the Queen? Clark. Well, Jenny described a really fantastic reception for the Queen here. People were delighted to see her. Even the families of those who died in the massacre, who had harboured strong feelings, seemed to feel that by laying a reed and signing the book, the Queen had somehow atoned for what had happened. There were some people, though, who felt that she should have at least written a message in the book. And of course, Prince Philip perhaps really should have kept his thoughts to himself at such a very, very sensitive time. All he achieved by his comments was to inflame the media and stir up public opinion. There was also an incident in Madras, in South India, where the Queen had expected to make a speech at the state banquet. The Indian government said this would be a breach of protocol and the Queen did not make her speech. But was this a snub to the Queen by the Indian government, as the newspapers suggest? Well, the message from Buckingham Palace is that they didn't see it as a snub to the Queen, but rather miscommunication between the central government in Delhi and the local government in Madras. It had been thought that the Queen would be making a speech when in fact it was only ever intended to be an exchange of toast and a few words. Things had been going wrong and this seems to have been an attempt by the Indian government to show that they were in control. However, Buckingham Palace are not concerned. The British government have declared the Queen's tour of India a huge success. But was it mismanaged by the Foreign Office? Well, according to Jenny, there are two ways of looking at this tour. On the one hand, the Queen was welcomed and warmly received by the people. But, on the other hand, it was a very sensitive time. It happened, after all, during the 50-year celebrations, and there are still strong feelings about the past. The tour was arranged by the previous Tory government, and it seems to have been mistimed. It really shouldn't have clashed with their celebrations. What does this say about how India feels about its historical links with Britain and its membership of the Commonwealth? 
Well, Jenny feels that India still bears some resentment about British colonial rule, and there's still a certain amount of sensitivity and even some hatred of the British. However, India does want to change and, in doing so, establish itself as a modern-day country with good links with Britain rather than dwelling on the past. But it's not easy to forget everything that's happened and better relations will take time to achieve. Thanks, Clark. We've all seen recently reports of incidences of child abuse. And again and again we see, both on television and in newspapers, the word paedophile. This is someone who's sexually attracted to young children, who might photograph young children, fondle them, expose themselves, or have sex with them. Whereas the term sex offence can refer to an offence against someone of any age. Since August, the government have declared that under a new law, anyone convicted of a sexual offence against a child must, on their release from prison, register their name and address. If they're to change their name or address, they must notify the police. But what happens to this information? Should the police inform head teachers of schools or social services departments? Or should we, the public, be informed that someone on the register is living in our area? Or should we respect their anonymity? I'm discussing this with my guests, Jane, Valerie, Brenda and Brian. Brian, you're a father. Supposing there was a paedophile living in your area, would you want to know where they lived? Well, yes, because how else can I protect my children if I don't know that one of these people lives next door? If something was to happen and no one had told me, I'd be livid. Like any parent who has children, nobody wants a sex offender living in their street or in their community. But if they have served their time in prison, do we really have the right to say that they should go back to prison, or what? I think that as a parent, it's normal for any parent to react angrily and say that they don't want that person living in their area. I think that's a very normal reaction. People react that way because for them, their children come first. The sex offenders' rights are just not a priority. I think it's very difficult for parents to appreciate that the sex offender has any rights. That's very hard for them. When a sex offender has been to court and then to prison for however long, then they should be assessed by a panel of people who would determine whether they are fit to return to the community. If they then have to register that would mean that they would never be free in their own minds. They'll always have this knowledge that the police are looking out for them. I think it's important to look at what this act will really mean. It says that the police may tell a head teacher of a school, but that doesn't mean that the police will tell them every time. So why and how do they decide to tell? and when not to tell a school. Do you think that a paedophile has the right to remain anonymous, that we shouldn't know who they are, and we should just respect their privacy? If the police don't pass on that information to schools and playgroups, how do they decide? How do they make that decision to disclose that information or not? Who are they really protecting? The child or the paedophile? I think that naturally I would want to know. If the police only inform the head teacher, but the head teacher can't tell the parents, then yes, what is the point of telling the head teacher in the first place? Surely the head teacher should then inform the parents. If it's only the staff who know and not the parents, I'd be very annoyed if they knew, and I didn't. I really do wonder, who is this register for? Is it to protect the sex offenders or the children? Well, it means that the police know where these sex offenders are. And 
I suppose that if they know where they are, well, then they can protect our children. I agree with what you said, but you're talking about known paedophiles. But what about all the others that we don't know about? There are more paedophiles out there. What about them? We don't know where they are or who they are, so the risks are still there. OK, so we've got this register, but how can we really protect our children? How can we keep them safe? I feel that it's the responsibility of the Home Office to tell the public so that we can protect our children more. If they don't, then this register is just a waste of time. Yes, the police will have this information, but what about the public? OK, so people's names will be on the register. But it's very difficult for the police to keep tabs on these people all the time. They just don't have enough resources. Maybe they should have those electronic tags that they have for football hooligans. The thing is, children are being abused today. How many more are going to be abused tomorrow? And how many more the day after that? And the day after that? What are the government doing about it? What are the government doing to protect children more? What can we do to keep children safe from sex offenders? I think there's just not enough being done to protect them. Mm, I'd have to agree with that. But it's a very, very difficult subject and we could never resolve it with our discussions here. We would, however, like to see more of these kind of discussions in Behind the News. So if you have any strong views on a news item, do let us know. For example, have any of you witnessed a road rage incident recently that you'd like to tell us about? Well, that's all for this week, and we'll be back next month with another Behind the News. Mm -hmm.